Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. I'm excited to introduce you to author William David Ellis. He's got some great stories to share with us, including the princess who forgot she was beautiful. Thank you for joining us from East Texas by Skype. How are you today? I'm um, well. Good to hear you. Good to be here. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. So tell me about these characters because I fell in love with the series. They kept me up for days on end. Really? Yes. I love the way the supernatural elements play into it. Mm -hmm. The whole backstory that it leads us into as you go from novel to novel. Mm -hmm. And the time travel. How did yeah. you come up with all of these elements? Well, I would be lying if I told you I outlined it and planned it. I just started writing a story. And I think that uh, for creative people, that our subconscious is a great store of power. And um, so I would write, and then I would think, okay, what happens next? And I'd write down the options of what happens next. And I would go with the craziest or the most twisted, and then I'd, I'd write a scene. And um, when I started, I'd never written a novel before. If you've read Dragons and Romans, that was my first one. Wow. And uh, I didn't know how to write a long extended novel, but I, years ago, I read a lot of Tom Clancy and he writes several stories at once and he brings them all together. And I thought, well, I can write several short stories that tie together. And so that's what I did. And then as I grew over the writing and my ability to write, um, they started coming together more and, and I would say, okay, now what did I do in this last scene and how do I keep it going here? And there were a couple of times where I would just go off in one tangent and then have to go and edit that and come back and, you know, bring it all together. It's like tying your shoes and pulling up the laces tight. And so that's, that's how it all came together. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Well, you say you're a supernaturalist. What does that mean? Well, years ago, I was trained um, in a religious system that um, believed that God did things in the past, but doesn't do them in the future and now. And then I began to encounter some amazing phenomena. Uh, I saw people healed. I uh, saw demons manifest. And I hate to share with this. I mean, it's the first time we've ever met, and you're going to think I'm a lunatic, but it happened. And when you see those phenomena, it changes your perspective, your worldview changes in a moment. I saw a man walk slowly toward a lady that was um, in the occult and her body began to vibrate and he wasn't threatening. He just had his hands out. He just like that. And, and she just fell on the ground. I'm going, what the heck? And in the, I'm a skeptic by nature. And that's why when I finally am convinced of something, I am convinced because I've looked at it from every angle. And so the supernatural is real. We are naturally supernatural, but most people are not trained to, to hear or to see. They see, but they don't. And uh, in my experience over now 40 years of dealing with a lot of different people and a lot of different mindsets and worldviews, that the supernatural is real, that uh, people can get into trouble, and that um, God is real too, and he's gracious and good. And, uh, you know, most people don't have a problem – they say they don't believe in God. The problem is they do. They just don't like the God they believe in. And in my books, I try to paint a different picture, a picture that I think is more authentic because everything we do, we taint. You know, whether we're in a religious system or we're not, um, we have a tendency to bring our own perspectives, our own experiences, our own tragedies, our own bias, and we filter everything through that system. And in my book, 
excellent in my books. I try to uh, bring that to people's awareness. You know, that I'm not just preaching, but you know, I've, I've lived, and I'm hoping that my characters manifest that. So that's kind of did that answer your question about supernatural? I don't want to go into all the things I've seen because you're really well thinking about. <laughs> no, definitely. I like the fact that there was that love that was lost that was found again. The time travel to correct things that were happening in the future from the past, like looking back and not making the same mistakes. Um, I thought the grandfather in the story or father was the you know ultimate storyteller and grandfatherly type. And it was really twisted, though, the way that his love interest comes into the first book compared to the other books. Uh, what do you mean by twisted? I'm, I don't well, it was, unex saying. it was completely unexpected. Like, who she is, I didn't expect her to oh, be yeah. her. You know, it yeah. was kind of like, it kind of gave you little hints along the way. Mm -hmm. And then it surprised you. But it was really well woven. Thank you. It really you. flowed really great. Well, it, I can't take care for being a master planner, but I can fly by the seat of my pants most days. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Uh, and I love the dog that came in later. Raleigh. The shape-shifting dragon aspect of the whole series. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't think you left anything out. Oh, there's more to come. Yeah, well, you've read the books. Uh, you know about the Sasquatch. That's the uh, professor of organic chemistry at East Texas Community College. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then um, uh, there's there are a lot of things. And I, what I worry about and wonder about is uh, have I brought too much in? And am I going to be able to pull all this together? Because I've discovered that every book narrows the parameters. You know, the, and at first I could uh, talk about a lot of things and then I have to continue with these things. And my habit is to bring in more and more, but I have to finish some stories and uh, I'm struggling with that. Wow, it doesn't you, look like it. Because <laughs> well, these good. books kept me up till the middle of the night. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, they were really engaging. I like the way that... Um, you brought in social issues and going back in history to World War II yeah. and some of the testing that was going on and how things came about. Because mm -hmm. you're like, ah, oh, did he really do that? What happened? Like, how did this part happen? You know, because they're following these moral values along the way and they have this mutual connection, mm -hmm. you know, and the way that they... Matt, it's so innocent. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Bell Rodham. We're talking about Sarah. Who, who are you? We're talking about the main, um, the main two characters. Okay, Hank and Sarah, and, and he's Hank as an older man, and then we we follow him, and he's Harry, you know, as a younger man, and that's who he is the rest of the series. And all this is a spoiler. You do know that, don't you? I'm giving away all my stuff here. No, no, we won't give it all away. But Hank <laughs> and Sarah, they have these ups and downs and trials and tribulations that, you know, tr transverse across time. But I just thought it was really good how the story backs up and hits social issues that were going on during World War II that, you know, are still in fact going on in some places today. Like what? What social issues? Like um, genetic testing, genetic. Sure. Yeah, engineering. You know, without people's knowledge, too. Right, right. Um, I'm trying to answer some questions, and I'm making up solutions. And, you know, when it's fantasy and fiction, you can do what you want. But, you know, your readers are going to say, well, come on, give us a little bit of realism here. And I try to do some research. And if the experiment was ever done, it's fair game, you know, even if it flopped or failed miserably. Um, and so I, I use that. I do a lot of research. I found out more than I wanted about Nazi torture and Holocaust and uh, those things. And in the, the book I'm writing now called Rivals, that's where uh, the two female, major female characters come together um, and become friends because they both love Harry. 
And uh, he is, well, I'm going to give away a spoiler. Um, oh, don't forget. give away a spoiler. Right. It is. You ask these questions, I'm not supposed to answer. Um, that was anyway. a real cliffhanger, though. Thanks a lot. When's Rivals going to be done? Um, 45,000 words into it. It's probably be the fall before I can get it, and, you know, unless I can really find some time. If it rains a lot, I'll get done quicker. Okay. <laughs> if not, if not. We'll you know, cross our from. fingers for lots of rain. Yes, yes. Um, so I don't know what we're talking about. Where, where are we at? How do you make up the characters? Are they characteristics oh. of people that you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Really? I, I don't know that I can't, I could make a person up. I've got to copy them, and copy and paste. I take a little bit from this person, a little bit from that person. Uh, I've got some friends that are strange, and they're wonderfully strange. You know, uh, one of my friends is Steve Ford, and Steve loves the Lord with all his heart, but cusses like a sailor. And I'm going, what the heck? <laughs> Man, you got a foul mouth. But uh, oh, but it's so much fun. And he, I've used elements of him probably for Brady, the Sasquatch. And then I also have a friend who's a, a former colonel, Army Ranger Special Forces. Mm -hmm. And he is my military consultant. I said, what does it feel like to get shot? You know, I said, well, it hurts. And I'm going, well, yeah, figure that. You know, uh, what does it feel like in the middle of combat? He says, you don't feel. You react. And, um, you know, and then I've got some friends. Uh, this little lady who attends our church. She has a knot on her head, a little bun. And uh, I'm always tempted to grab her by the knot, pick her up, and see if she twists. She spins. Uh, I've used some of her characteristics in these people. It's just easier to copy and paste people than try to develop one from ground up. So, um, and my wife has snuck in there several times, her characteristics, you know, and it's just, that's what I do. I just, I don't create anything. I just steal it. Nice. So. I love the fight scenes um, with the Romans in the desert. Oh, okay. That was really well done. All right. What did you now, use for you, research for that portion of the books? Called Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just it's not hard. Google Roman catapults uh, and things like that. And the Dragons and Romans is not it's standalone. That's what you're talking about, and it's not a part of the Harry Ferguson Chronicles. Although a couple times in the Harry Ferguson Chronicles, I allude to that book, and. Uh, also, a couple of my children's books that I'm in the process of writing. But, um, yeah, um, that, well, oh, gosh, Dragons and Romans. I just remember how I got started on that. This whole process started with me visiting a little town in East Texas, or excuse me, Central Texas. Mm -hmm. where, uh, they have fossils, dra uh, not dragon, dinosaur fossils in the river. You know, they're billions of years old, and right smack dab in the middle of them is a human footprint. And I'm going, wait a minute, how could this be? And they're trying, trying, trying to make excuses. They're saying, look at it, the way it's formed, the way the heel is, the way the toes are. This is human. I'm going, oh, man, this throws everything on its end. So I began to do some research. Was it possible for humans and dinosaurs to coexist? And then there's this uh, temple in Thailand, I believe it is, that actually has a stegosaurus, that's what they used to call it. It's, it's, it's in the carved thousands of years old carved into the the frame of this building and you know every culture has its uh its legends of dragons and even in the bible job 5 41 it has a fire breathing dragon most people don't realize that because they've never read the bible but job 41 mm -hmm. fire breathing dragon right there so i started doing archaeological and historical research and i discovered a tiny little blurb and one of the Roman writers, I think it was Livy, I think that's what you say his name. And he said, a dragon attacked a Roman legion outside of Carthage. And they had to defeat it with catapults and, and huge rock throwing machines. And it crushed several soldiers. And I'm going, I want to know more. Well, there's no more. Nothing. And I thought, oh, man, can you imagine what happened? And I started taking notes and started writing and started thinking. And I did some research on Carthage. And they were horrible. A child sacrifice. Hundreds of urns of children's bones have been discovered in the, the remains of Carthage. And then I also uh, continued that study of uh, child sacrifice and discovered, and according to the Old Testament scriptures, that the, the Israelis, 
Hebrews were attacking a Philistine uh, city. And the Philistine king sacrificed his son on the wall. And then the next phrase is amazing. It says, and the fury against Israel was so great, they retreated. And there's all through time, there have been human sacrifice. And what's the deal? Why do they want to do that? Something is released, something dark and powerful. And I'm not advocating this by any stretch of imagination. It's incredibly evil, but it, it releases power. And I think a lot of people know that and they don't claim to know it. They do. And uh, so all this came together. And that's where Dragons and Romans was started. And uh, there was a Roman general who is an agnostic. And he doesn't believe in dragons. He doesn't believe in supernatural. You know, he's, you know, and, and there, there's, there's this lady who's a slave who's also a prophetess. And she, um, she has a different worldview. And they fall in love. And the, the, the Roman soldier is very agnostic until he starts to have dreams and visions. And he meets some Old Testament prophets in his dream. And he doesn't know who they are. He's engaging them, you know. And um, I'm not advocating a particular way of believing. I'm just talking about authentic supernatural realism that people have all the time. Like people today in certain groups are having major dreams. Their whole culture is dreaming. They're having visions. What's going on? You can Google it. You can find it. And the person who's showing up in those dreams is Christ. Now, that's amazing. And so you ask me if I'm supernatural, if you better believe it. Visions, dreams, and they come into my books. And uh, this this lady in Dragons and Romans named Miriam, she sings. She's a seer. She sings. And it touches the hearts of the Roman soldiers around her. And um, so I try to share that element. I don't know. Um, and, and just um, not be, just to be real. You know, just to be real. And everybody has their own stereotyped images of what, you know, religion or supernatural looks like. And I try to be as authentic as I possibly can, documenting, not um, because I think everybody's got a little bit of the truth in them. But I also believe that we've turned away from that, every single individual. And uh, but some some people are constantly being drawn and that magnet, that draw is very significant. If you remember in Harry Chronicles, the princess who forgot she was beautiful, uh, there's a sense of betrayal. And, and she is dealing with guilt and condemnation because she actually stabbed Harry, the peasant boy, when he was in the, you know, trying to rescue her. She had been overcome by the demonic, by the demon, by the dragon. And she was becoming that. And in their first few minutes, it just totally possessed her. And she, she tried to stab Harry. And, and she dealt with that. She struggled with that, trying to find absolution. Anyway, I got carried Sorry. That reminded me of Stockholm Syndrome, that whole yep. twist really? of that. How so? Yeah, because that's how someone may react when the, she's become dependent on the dragon. That's right, yeah. You know, she's like, he's her source of companionship, of food, of, you know, just being able to sustain life. And then having been there for so long, by the time Harry comes, it's mm -hmm. a foreign concept to her. Yes, absolutely. And her, so it made her reaction understandably realistic under the circumstances. Yep. yep. What do you think about the sword, the talking sword? Did that seem uh, too funky, too crazy? You remember I'm talking about the speaker sword and how he speaks? Can you repeat you it? Do you remember the sword, the speaker sword, who uh, bonds oh, yeah. with him? Yeah. What do you think about it? The speaker sword. I thought he could be conniving. I think he wanted to always do the best or the, you know, he always wanted to do the right thing, but mm -hmm. how he can screwed it to be the right thing. Oh. was overreaching. Like, yes. it was believable. And then there are people like that, that I think I'm doing the best for you, but you know they're really not. Or they <laughs> did it for selfish reasons. Yeah. But you could yeah. see that twisted logic and how he 
adds, he actually adds to a lot of the problems that are going on when he could have simply just relayed the real message. Yeah. Now, what about uh, when uh, Sarah in the desert finds a manuscript that is a lie? The uh, live is what she calls her. She's the, the book. And you discover that Liv and the sword have a relationship. Remember, I don't know if you remember that part or not. And she's fussing at him and he's backing up. And uh, it's, it's, I went crazy on that. And how do you bring all that together? You know, most stories just focus. They plot along. And in mine, I've got so many things going on. I'm thinking this is a circus and I'm a monkey. You know, I don't know how to fix this. No, it all comes together great. It's a really great story. And one of your websites, I guess the best way for people to get an introduction to how you write and the type of feelings that you evoke is where you wrote, um, I think it was a Facebook page, but you wrote a story about your dog. Oh, And yeah. I just cried. And when I read these, they just, like, they pull your emotions. They make you angry for things that you know happened at the time that could happen again. Um, but it was just great the way you tug at emotions, just like the storyteller in the first book. Yeah, that's because I am a storyteller. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, that's for sure. And Raleigh, oh, that was one of the worst days of my life. I don't know if you want me to go into that or not, but uh, that story, Whistle and He Will Come, on my Facebook page and on my author page, um, was written about my friend. And uh, like in a week's time, he went down where he couldn't even lift his legs. He was just hurting. And the last night of his life, I held him all night long. And uh, that was hard. And the guy that uh, the Sasquatch is modeled after, Steve Ford, you know, you know you've got a real friend when he'll come over and shoot your dog for you. I mean, <laughs> that's awful. That it sounds terrible. But what was the alternative? Just to let him linger? I couldn't do that. Yeah. It was and, uh, so heartbreaking, though. God, it was. It was. I wanted to jump in that grave with him. And that's why my heart was torn and I was praying. And, and I started, you know, because the Bible doesn't say much about whether animals have souls. And so I was praying. And that's what I heard. You know, when you stand up again, whistle. He will come. And I go, Whoop! yes, <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. So, yeah. And Raleigh, also, he shows up everywhere in the books, but wait till you meet Lizzie. She hasn't been on the spot yet, but Harry named his daughter after one of his dogs and called her Lizzie. And of course we have a German shepherd named Lizzie. And if I keep missing her name, she's gonna show up over here and she's gonna crawl in my lap. So, but Raleigh and Lizzie, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh mm -hmm. and Queen Elizabeth, they were companions and so are our dogs. Anyway, I don't want to go any further than that because the live will start, you know, just snotting and squalling right here on the screen. I do not want to do that. So ask me something else. Well, you did an outstanding job. You can tell they're woven with humor and love and adventure and tears and just the usual ups and downs of life and some that are beyond our scope, sometimes of understanding or comprehending fully and just a nice way to like, you don't tell us how to think about it. You weave it into the story so that, you know, we can make a determination of which way to go. Right. That's always, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I love that, the dogs. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> They're real. <laughs> They're real. Uh, I'm thinking the, um, the scene I'm struggling with now happens in the next book called Rivals. It happens in a concentration camp. And what amazes me, and I took it from history and just stole it again. You know, the best stories have already been told. Uh, Maximilian Colby, and I changed the priest's name. He, uh, he sacrificed his life for some people that didn't even believe the way he does. And because uh, there was this man who had tried to escape and they killed him, but they were going to kill 10 of the prisoners. And this actually happened. And Colby volunteered to be one of those prisoners. And they starved him to death. But what, what, what happened was the Nazi guards, after three or four days of having these men in a cell, they wouldn't go near it because they were afraid of what they felt coming out of those walls. You know, that's power. 
And uh, the evil villains of this latest book are going to try to sacrifice this priest, but they do not know what they're getting into. Because there's a difference between a martyr and somebody sacrificed. And you release the power, but it's not what you're looking for. So that's coming, and I hope I didn't ruin the book by telling that. Wow. Well, I am so excited to see what you come up with next. And real quick before we leave, okay. how many books have you done all together? Um, five, I think. I have to count. Um, one book was nonfiction. It was written long ago, and um, I've changed. So, I mean, I'm a different person, and it, I can actually write now. <laughs> and then there's Dragons and Romans. There's A Princess Who Forgot She's Beautiful. There was Dances with My Dragon. And there was Kisses of My Enemy. Now, that, I love that cover. That is a beautiful cover. Um, and then I'm working on Rivals. And then the last book in that series, I think, there may be several short stories. And, and what do you call it? Crossovers? Is that what you call it? Uh, they're coming. But five books with more to come. And then there's the Haunted Prophet series that I hadn't got started on. So that's coming too. Wow, so you're going to be busy. Oh, well, why not? I mean, if you love to write and you enjoy it and people enjoy it, I mean, the highest praise is for somebody who does not know you. They're not your mom or your aunt. Read your book and goes, oh, my gosh, you kept me up all night. That makes my heart happy. Thank you very much. And I hope you're telling the truth. Oh, well, I was up for a week with these. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, they were fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing so much about how you create these amazing tales. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we're looking forward to seeing more from you. All right. All right. And then we'll see when that next series starts, too. Okay. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. My pleasure. If you guys want an award-winning novel that'll keep you up for days and just lift you up and tear you apart at the same time, this series is it. We'll see you soon. <laughs>